It's Delia. That's me. Oh my gosh, hey Dealy Boppers, and welcome back to Baldur's Gate 2, where I'm just like, I'm relating way too hardcore to Emoen. Um, and I feel like I'm about to Bechtel test this game at some point. Like, I'm wondering, like, was there already an instance where, like, where... I hate that there's an option to tell her to calm down, because, like, she's getting out trauma, she's trauma venting, I know what that's like, and it's valid. Like, that's a natural response to trauma. Um, so I'm glad option one's here, but it just kind of disgusts me that option two is there. I feel like Jahira and our main character were, like, talking to each other, but, like, here's the thing. I feel like in a video game, it's like, the main character could be, like, any gender, right? So, so, obviously here, it's a girl. So, like, so, like, if she talks to any other woman about anything other than a man, it passes the Bechdel test. But, like, I feel like, I feel like looking for, for moments that it does this and sort of highlighting them, but it's, like, at the same time, it's, like, if a guy plays this game, he may be playing a male character, and, like, he's a guy, and so it, it doesn't really, it, it wouldn't pass the Bechdel test for that. You'd have to have, like, two of the female NPCs talking about something other than a man, and I feel like that is a little bit more, like, I feel like that actually passes the Bechdel test. I feel like playing a female character in a video game and seeing if it passes the Bechdel test is a little bit... Eh. It's like, I feel like in a video game you have to see if it passes if it passes the Bechdel test like with without the main character having to be female, you know? I, I just feel like that's the only, the only valid way to do it because the option's there, you know? It, it, it like it would it would be disingenuine to what the Bechdel test is like in the spirit of to to just count interactions of like my character with another character but like I feel like we're talking about Aaronicus a lot but at the same time it's like okay trauma venting that's normal I get that oh my gosh there's just so much trauma venting it's like I feel like there's it's like they establish they establish like things that were that were done in like vague terms aside from like cutting is like a little bit graphic and like but it's like you know the experience that she's been through and so it's like okay i feel like i feel like you know i feel i feel like i'm qualified to decide whether or not this is like traumatizing for someone who's been through this and it's not for me it's definitely relatable she sees the person who hurt her as a monster. And, like, that's... I mean, that's the way I feel, you know? <laughs> so... <clears throat> she feels like a genuinely strong female character. I don't want to, like... I know that we have, like, sort of a harmful trope of, like... Of, like, trying to satisfy, like, I guess a masculinely oriented idea of what we feel strength is. But I feel like M.O.N. is, like, she gets it out and I'm that kind of girl. Like, in my personal life, anyway. And I feel like I'm that kind of girl, honestly, in my public life, too. Like, I, I get my fucking trauma venting out, you know? And... It takes being vulnerable to do that, and I feel like that's a strength, and I feel like it's a genuine strength that's not rooted in any toxically masculine trope. So I'm gonna give Emoen points as like a, a good character. And and like I feel like she's I feel like she's wearing makeup, but I feel like it's like so it's so subtle, it's a little bit hard to tell. Like, she could be trying harder to cover up that scar that looks like maybe a daytime eyeshadow look at best, but it's a bit sloppy foundation job. And, like, I can't tell if it's just the artist's style of drawing lips or if she's wearing, you know, a lip color or not, but, like, she doesn't look ridiculously pin upishly done up. Jahira, on the other hand, is a completely different story. Look at that dewy fucking look. You know how much, like, it takes, like, a good foundation and a good highlighter and a good spritz to get that kind of glow, like, and that purple eyeshadow is, like, 
No elf comes out of their mother's womb with their with their eyes looking like that. She did not wake up this way. And she's in her armor with makeup. I I feel like I give I give passes a little bit more for sorceresses. I like her makeup. I feel like it has character. Like she she's trying to achieve a particular goth style with like her her eyeliner and her pale lips and like I can't tell if she has like foundation over or a lack of lipstick or just like a pale lip color, but it looks like she's it definitely looks like she's she's like put on some kind of like really pale makeup on her face. She's definitely wearing makeup. Oh my gosh, there's so much makeup. But like but like look at means. He is not wearing makeup. I'm ashamed of you, Minsk. You disappoint me. You put so little effort into your appearance this morning. <laughs> but like, Leandra's on point. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I'm that girl who's like, I don't know whether or not to feel silly about it because like I would be that girl in the fantasy setting who would like walk out of the house ready to go on an adventure wearing my makeup and like other characters would look at me and be like you're wearing makeup for an adventure and I'd be like I'm going to kick ass and look good while doing it and then it's like <laughs> I feel like that's valid but at the same time it's like I feel like there's just like this huge thing of like just just like way too many women in fantasy wearing makeup in like situations where your dedication to makeup has got to be serious to like to like really wear it under all those circumstances like I can see the inn or the tavern but like and I see maybe like like wandering around town and I guess if you're an adventurer and you're just like ready for adventure at every turn and you decide to put on your makeup in the morning, it's like that's valid. I've had characters like that. And they don't they don't deserve anyone's slut shaming <laughs> for for their personal decisions. But like I question so many times how often it is for like female gamers and how often it is just like because guys want to see a girl in makeup more than they want to see a girl without makeup, which is silly. Which is why I like being a lesbian, because like we don't necessarily have that thing in our world as much. I don't, I don't feel like it's a thing. I feel like we all still have that thing of like, oh gosh, I need to wear makeup for this and that and the other. It needs to be this way for that and this way for that and this way for that. Like... Some of us manage to like kick that in its ass, but we all feel that way at some point or another. And like at the same time, it's like we look at each other and it's just like it's 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 just girls without makeup are so pretty. We really are. And and like lesbians, we know that. I I don't feel like all straight guys like admit that. I feel like I feel like like deep down they know it's true. I don't feel like they admit it. I feel like that's just like a toxic masculinity thing. But, like, we, we teach men to think that no woman is, is feminine enough without makeup, and it's ridiculous, and we, like, we just put women in makeup so everywhere to the point where it's, like, you have, you have selfies where it's, like, check out this celebrity without makeup, and, and you're, like, you're a girl, and you look at it, you're, like, they're wearing a fuck ton of makeup, and guys are just, like, ooh, ah, why can't my girlfriend look like this without makeup, and it's, like, shut up, your girlfriend looks gorgeous without makeup, and you know it. But anyway, that's just the, this is my like ten cents on on the subject. I feel like I feel like that gets my feelings out about it. Eamon's the only person I feel like I'm just like okay, so she's. What is this effect? Why does it look different? Because Minsk is is obviously poisoned. He's screwed. All of my I left my neutralized poison scrolls all over in Dragonlands in Champions of Kryn. Wah wah wah. Okay, so like obviously I don't have any mage spells that are good for fixing that. That's why I came here to see. What what is this? Where do you see what the little icon means? I remember like when you had the game on CD and you got it in like the box, it came with like this plastic fold out that told you 
what all the little symbols meant, among other things, like quick spell references and shit like that, but like, I have no idea where to look to see what this little hourglass with, like, it looks like, oh, is she slowed? I can't tell, because to me it looks like, it may just be my eyes. But to me, it looks like a blue hourglass with, like, a blue skull and crossbones in it. Like, it's trying to say something about poison. Like, slow poison or something. But I feel like poison just looks like this in these games. And I think she's just slowed and my eyes are fucking wonky. I need glasses. If you want to help, go to patreon.com slash and sign up to become a super daily bopper and get, like, awesome rewards for supporting my YouTube channel and music and, like, gaming videos. Anyway, um, I feel like, I feel like Minsk is about to die. Oh no, poor Minsk. Uh, but like, I don't have anything memorized. The only person who, in the party who could have anything memorized would be Jahira because she's a druid and it's like, I don't even know, does she like, she, she's, she's got like slow poison but she doesn't have neutralized poison. See, like, look, that's what it looks like. Is the, that's, but I can't tell. <laughs> and, and I don't know where to look, but like, anyway, I think, <clears throat> is like, is neutralized poison like, there you go. Poison and Neutralized Poison are both fourth level druid spells. And like, she could have one of these memorized, but she memorized this and she's already used it for the day, so it's just like, I chose a bad time to walk in here. Oh, just like, shit, no. I feel so like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel so bad about means. So, I like to imagine that, like, Yimue is just not, not just, like, completely shattered and traumatized the whole game, though, and that, like, she, she, like, recovers, because, like, that's, that's a good thing. That's, that's a responsible portrayal thing. Recovery is, is a thing. And responsible portrayal. Oh, good, Minsk is, is going to be fine. So, oh, shit. I found a key, but like, so I guess this is, this is like his dead wife's room. I found a key, but the thing was fucking trapped. God damn it. Yeah, let's, let's, uh. Oh my gosh. So. I feel like, I feel like probably Leandra and Imoen's experiences are similar. So like their, their focuses right now are probably similar. If this, if this was a movie and these two characters realistically grew up together as like sisters, which was like how the game, like, you know, that's how it was set up in the first game then I feel like they would probably be experiencing a lot of the same feelings and emotions right now. This is just so intense. It's like the game is just written like so intensely. Like, oh my gosh. These are just my feelings, like like playing this. But like, this is why I do like, you know, Zay and I do our gaming together on Trans Dimension Gaming, which is our new YouTube channel that you should check out. And I like to do my uh, my gaming personally, like separately because I just, I know I'm gonna analyze things like this. And I feel like, I feel like I should, for one, and I feel like at least, like, someone should, and it's like, why not me? Um, and I'm glad that, that we have someone automatically programmed to just run over, and that's actually my character. Wait, how is she, like, does she just have that as a, oh, cool, she has just, like, special abilities. 
I guess maybe this is from being... Oh, that meant she was casting Slow Poison on Minsk. That's why he stopped dying. Oh, my character did things. I totally need to acknowledge them for that. But, like, anyway... Wow. Like... Like... She totally has special abilities. I wonder if this is related to being to being Ball Spawn. Like, if it's because she's a child of, of Ball, the, the Lord of Murder. It's kind of funny. It sounds odd to say Ball Spawn, but, you know, it whatever. It's the, it's the name of the deity that they came up with. The dialogue just seemed like totally glitchy for a second. The chambers of the Master's wife have been entered. All must be destroyed. This guy cares more about the security of a room than he does about women's consent. It's just such a thoroughly disgusting character in my mind. So, like... I definitely want to, to kill this guy, but like, I am getting owned. I feel like I have gone through just a little bit too much without resting, and... I've got potions. I hate using them. But, like, I hate it less than reloading, so I'm gonna just, like, start passing them out. Anyway. I feel like, I feel like it's only real to comment on, like, themes when they show up in video games. I feel like I feel like to not do so is is like weak and shying away from from the discourse, you know. Because it's like art is is not just made to exist; it is made to be like subject to 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 critique and analysis, you know. And I feel like I feel like the whole fantasy genre is like very much in need of that because it's like you wonder it's like when a bunch of female characters show up in the game is it representation or is it fan service? And then like as a lesbian you're like well if there is fan service it's like is it at least done like well and like not just to please men and like is there fan service for like people of varying orientations and like more than just one gender, you know? And, like, I don't feel like Baldur's Gate was the best at this, if, if I'm going to be completely honest. I, I just, I don't feel like Baldur's Gate was necessarily the best at this at all. I don't feel like there are any LGBT romance options originally. I don't know if, it, if anything's changed, because they've, like, they included a trans character in one of the expansions for one of the games with the update, but, like... So, you know... Did I disarm that? Okay, I got like all like flustered in the heat of that of that approaching encounter. Oh my gosh, but like <laughs> There's lots of there's lots of magic stuff in these drawers. Okay, so who did I give these to? Who did I pick these up? I need to have all this shit identified. I feel like Leandra is the only person who can do that. Oh look, I have an identify scroll. It's totally like I feel as though it like I should just rest and memorize it and sell those later, but I feel like that's also a little bit cheap. The idea of like to me of characters resting too much, it's like how how many months does the the story of this game play out over? Which is valid and cool because it's like, oh hey, like a long story, like like a TV series as opposed to like a TV episode. But like at the same time, it's just like Every hunt jump on my sword while you can evil. It's just like, how long are you going to let this play out? You know? The Eyes of Truth, Helm of Infravision, being a scavenger of a sort, Babette Maelstrom had this helm to aid her in her dungeon excursions. She would later attribute her gathered wealth solely to its power, though it was as much her keen eyes as anything. I'm kind of cringing at the, at the name Babette. 
I can't think of any other way that the brain would just naturally want to pronounce that. It's cool that the weapon has, a, or rather the helmet, it's not a weapon, it's a piece of armor. It's cool that it has a story behind it. But, like, the character's name is Baybet. Really? That sounds like the kind of cheesy bullshit that my, that, like, my dad would come up with as a DM. Who's the kind of guy who would name a character a... Hang on a second. If I'm going to tell it, I have to tell it right. He's the kind of guy who would name a character Alexander Sylvester Scholl just to, like, make the players notice that if you abbreviated the first and middle initials of his name, it just spelled asshole. Like, this game is a cheesily just shoehorning in this name. I feel. Anyway, that's that's my decided opinion. Helm of Balderon, the, the fabled Helm of Balderon, legendary founder of Baldur's Gate, has long been rumored to wield powerful protective magic. The exact nature of this magic, however, has not yet been determined. But like, it says what it is. It says it gives like a plus one to my two hit armor class zero. I know, yeah, I know. I actually, I actually, like, did, literally just, like, said all of what that goes stands for. Um, armor class plus one. Saving throws plus one. Hit points plus five. Protects against critical hits. It's just, like, common sense. It's just, like, it's like riding a bicycle. But, look, it's one of these ridiculous horned helmets that, like, anyone who looks at history... It's, that is not, that is not combat practical armor. I don't feel like it's a good look, and it's not combat practical armor. It's like, it could be a good look. Actually, you know, I take it back. It is a good look. Actually, that's a good looking helmet. Like, if you're just looking at fashion purposes, that's a good looking helmet. Like, if you're looking at something for like, to put on a, a show with, that's a cool helmet. I mean, the horns are kind of sexy, but like, but like, a lot of helmets are not a good look. And it's like, and it's like, if you're gonna make, if you're gonna make a helmet to put on, it's like, make me want to wear the helmet super duper bad. Like, and this, even though it's just like, it doesn't make me want to do that because it's like, it could have like horns like a tiefling. And instead it's like these sort of meh, you know, it's, it's like banana horns. And, <laughs> and it's just like, it's got all these bonuses and it's like, I just look at him like, ooh, bonuses. I want to wear it. Like, like for realsies, but like, oh my gosh. It's just, it's just like, I, I want, I do want to wear it though for, for the, the, like the additional hit points. But like, I could also give it to Minsk for that. And it's like, here's my main beef with it though. It's like, it's like, because it is actually pretty. Like, let's face it. If we're going to talk about a pretty helmet and ugly helmet, I feel like it looks a little bit weird on Minsk. I feel like it looked a little bit sexy over here on the Andra, but it looks horrible on Minsk. And it's just like, so let's talk about this because this is a horrid looking helmet. She literally looks like she's like an imp or something. And it's like, but it's, it's a little bit less impractical. I don't know why it looks different down here than it does up here. Like it just looks like a totally different helmet. Like it looks like it has tiny horns on it, but they're not super duper impractical. I still feel like they're impractical. And we're just going to call this helmet impractical. By the way, helmets are like, they prevent critical hits. So like, I think a mage can, I think like a, I think a mage can wear them and still cast spells, but like, this is impractical. This is entirely impractical. No civilization has ever worn helmets like this in combat. But like, you will be hard pressed not to find a dwarf in fantasy with a helmet like this somewhere around. And like, guys, we gotta, we, I feel like we gotta stop at a point putting these ridiculous horns that people can just grab and like fuck with you with on helmets. But you know what? I'm just like, I'm going to put it on her because it looks better on her than it does on me. It's, and like, they prevent critical hits. So if someone can wear one, like, why not? Helm of Infravision in the Eyes of Truth. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I can 
Put in a character that doesn't already have Improvision just to make plot sense. I can put this helmet on Minsk. Oh dear. And those wings. Like, once again, like, super nifty fantasy armor stuff, but, like, I don't know if that's really realistic in combat. I feel like that's, that's like, way more of a... It's, like, way more of a bane than a boon to have great big projecting flares on your helmet. It looks like he's compensating for something. It looks like he's trying to be a dragon. Um, and it looks like, it's like something that I would like, if I saw a woman wearing this on a runway at a fashion show, I'd be like, ah, oh, just like, bra blah, like, like, blah, you know? But like, it's like seeing literally just like, <sighs> this ridiculous helmet on this like, on this like this character i like that he's like he doesn't seem necessarily like super toxically masculine he seems really lovable and like this absolute teddy bear if like a little bit not all right in that but like it's just funny just seeing it in this ridiculous help with the wings the sides of his head on either side of his head it's like i feel like if a woman felt like she wanted to like overcompensate about her wings if you follow me she would like she would like wear a helmet with like wings that were just like huge on either side of her face, but like I don't see necessarily. It's just, it's so silly. I'm sorry. I'm really not, but it's so silly. Just this helmet looks entirely impractical, but because it's fantasy. It goes. It just, it, it exists. It's there. No one questions the practicality of these ridiculous fins off of the side of this motherfucking helmet's head case, or whatever you call them. The, really, the body of the helm, the only part of a helm that would exist in reality in, like, in, like, the real world. I don't understand why fantasy is just, like, so full of these overdone motifs. It's, like, are they trying to establish a culture that, like, is reverent to dragons or something? Or, like, influenced by dragons and, like, other beasties with wings like that? And so they, like, put these wing-like projections on the sides of the helmet to, like, imitate, I don't know, like, a dragon's ears looking all wingish or something. And it's like, okay, maybe they're trying to establish a culture, but at the same time, it's like, don't make the thing look so damn just, like, completely off-the-wall, ridiculously like a bad idea your helmet sucks eggs you know it's like nice that improvision bonus and i don't know how it protects against critical hits because i would feel like in a helmet like that an enemy would just like walk up to you grab you by your head fins and like and like throw you over their shoulders or like or like throw you to the ground or twist your head around and break your neck or like and the same thing with the gigantic horns. It's like, it's a cool, sexy looking fashion statement of a helmet, presuming that like, you know, no animals were harmed in the making of, of this helmet, which I'm just going to assume some animal was, but maybe it was a monster. Maybe it was an evil monster. Maybe it was an intelligently, will, willfully evil monster that for the good of, of like the city of Baldur's Gate, by the founder had to be like slain or something which that would make for a cool story like if it was like some kind of dragon horns or something that would be cool i'm just like i'm just hoping that that no one just like went out into a into a field and slaughtered a cow for its horns for this helmet you know this brilliant gem is of indeterminate origin, constantly shifting colors from bright blues and violets to black and even shades of gray. It obviously came from the pommel of a sword, perhaps a specific one. It's obviously magic, but it's, it doesn't tell me what it does. I guess I shouldn't really necessarily expect Minsk to, to be able to figure that out on his own. He's, he's not a very intelligent or like magically inclined character. Oh my gosh, so I'm going to identify these artifacts. Uh, I'm going to identify these artifacts in the next video. Till next time, be your most beautiful you.